AMD was on form at this point in time, and it seemed after the release of the HD 5870 that nothing else would be able to top it. This is of course right up until the release of the HD 5970. Here we have the AMD Radeon HD 5970. Not just any HD 5970, but the XFX Black Edition, which comes complete with two Hemlock XT cores with 3200 shader units, which is all based upon the Terascale 2 architecture. They're clocked in at a massive 725 MHz and can overclock way higher due to these chips being to being a higher quality, which was sort of a standard thing for these HD 5970 cards. It has 2 gigabytes of GDDR5 VRAM, of which 2 gigs is actually usable, which comes clocked in at a fast 1000 MHz. It consumes around 300 watts when in use, and supports the majority of the latest APIs including DirectX 11 and OpenGL 4.3. And as many of you know, we don't like to hop straight into the benchmarks, as this card has a very interesting story about it. From a time not so long ago when AMD was on top in regards to about every feature right down to power consumption, the HD 5870 was trading blows with a GTX 480 while sipping power in comparison. Supplies of these chips were high and the prices were low, and it seemed like a winning streak for AMD. In fact, AMD's strategy was a winning one to create the most lucrative chip in the mid-range, rather than capitalise in on the small sales to be left in the highest end. It allowed them to appease the interest of most gamers, and is similar to what they did with Polaris, isn't it? The power consumption was reduced by heavily binning the chips. Only the best of the best became used on these boards to help keep temperatures and power consumption low. It only required an 8-pin and a 6-pin connector for power, so it's definitely not banned in terms of compatibility with most power supplies especially considering this is the same type of connectors you need for a GTX 480 and you're getting two cards running on it. Something that, well, Fermi struggled with was the temperatures, but this cooler had something clever up its sleeve. Using vapour chamber technology, essentially a big flat heat pipe, this cooler can dissipate over 400 watts with nothing more than a singular, quite quiet fan. And I thought the HD 3870X2 had a good cooler, well, this thing takes it to a whole nother level. Some cards did come with two 8-pin connectors to allow for some incredibly high overclocks, and I believe it was Sapphire that did this for the little while while the cards were released, but not many are sold and those cards are quite hard to find nowadays. It does have a crossfire header, so you can use two of these together if you really want to use four cards at once but want to conserve space. But then again, when you're at that stage, that's some really high enthusiast level. Now, by now, I rather enjoy these dual GPU cards, as my first experience with Crossfire was actually one on the channel, with the HD 3870X2 that we tested a few months ago. They are literally just plug and play, and it recognises two separate cards with the same name, making it very easy to install, especially with the latest drivers supported being the AMD Crimson ones, which supports Crossfire and fixes a lot of the issues with the newer titles. But moving on from that, we need to get this card cleaned up and put back together, as this card is really definitely already one of the best cards I own, even if it's only by aesthetics and the story that goes behind how we got this kind of power. But as for putting it in my PC, it's the biggest card I own, even larger than the GTX 480, the HD 3870X2, and my own R9285, so you'll need a pretty big case to contain this kind of card. But luckily, all of the heat is blown straight out of the case, so you don't have to worry about actually the airflow in the case if you do get one, which is quite a nice little thing to have. But it's time to get it fired up and see how it performs in some games. Up first we have the usual with GTA 5, which has some of the best crossfire and actually multi-core support I've ever seen in an open world game. In 1080p with the high option selected, we achieved a nice and playable 69fps average for the majority of the time. 
However, on occasion the game could slow down a little bit to the 1% lows of 31 FPS and the 0.1% lows of 15 FPS. Not entirely unplayable by any means, as I use this card for a whole evening of gaming at these settings. CSGO scales amazingly well, so we ran the game in 1080p with low settings and scored an average of 162 FPS, which was way more than playable, especially considering the new Dust 2 is actually one of the more intensive maps. The 1% lowest down to 65 FPS were also hardly a hindrance, and even then the 0.1% lowest down to 43 FPS weren't even bothersome. Altogether a great card for games like this, and you could definitely turn up a few of those settings without any performance hit at all. Fallout 4 was not too bad at all, but did express some issues with the card, as it could suffer from extreme frame drops from time to time, but this was only at certain intervals and was only momentary. Of course this is definitely an issue with Crossfire, as I've never seen it before with any single cards, but still for the most part the game did run completely fine so don't let these small issues deter you, but do be cautious that Crossfire does come with a few problems. Minecraft, oddly enough, scaled even better than Fallout 4 did, with no performance issues at all, even with some shaders enabled. The high resolution texture pack was also there, and the game was flawless and looked great etc. We had a 42fps average, 1% loads of 26fps, and 0.1% loads of 9fps. I was using Optifine so that the game would start with Crossfire enabled, which is essential if you want to run it on this card. and it was around here that I had some of the worst experiences with gaming or Crossfire that I've ever had. We started Borderlands 2 and we had a lovely 110 FPS average, but had huge input lag, frame times that made me want to die, and the game was just a stuttering pile of garbage. I'm really not quite sure what went wrong here. Enabling just one of the cards would fix the issue, but it's a shame to think of how much performance is going to waste. However, in the most recent FIFA game, which came out this year, we achieved a nice 75 FPS average. In fact, most of the time it was running at an even higher FPS, around 90 or so. But in cutscenes and menus, the game has a weird mechanic where it will drop you straight down to a locked 25, which led us to our 1% loads of 26 FPS and 0.1% loads of 16 FPS. Still way more than playable and you could definitely turn a few of those settings up. But I really don't know why they have this FPS cap which I don't know if there's a way to get rid of, but it's a tad annoying going from 90 down to 25 every time you score a goal or something. And finally to round off our gaming benchmarks with Prey in 1080p with the load preset selected, but antroscopic filtering turned up to 16 times, we saw a very playable 42fps average, 1% lows down to 26fps and 0.1% lows down to 11fps definitely playable, especially considering this game is made in 2017 and we're playing all the way in the 1080p resolution. In synthetics, for those of you that want to see a direct comparison, we scored a nice 4621 in Firestrike, when paired with an AMD Ryzen 5 1600, which is a fairly nice score for only a £25 graphics card. It's somewhere between GTX 750Ti and AMD Radeon HD 7850 in performance, so when you consider the score we're getting, there's definitely some value to be had in this card. And in conclusion once again, it may have only been a short video, but I did spend a good few days using solely this card, and yes it is a step down from my usual R9285, but it's cool and quiet, topping out at 75 degrees C on both of the chips, with the fan only spinning at 35%. It ran every game I needed it to well, and I can't fault the price to performance you get with this card, as you get two amazing cards for the price of one. They can overclock well if you wanted to give them a go in that, and in general they're a fun experience to be had with Crossfire, because they're simple and plug and play. Realistically though, for anyone spending more than £25, it's not worth it due to the power requirements and the fact for only £10 more you can actually get a GTX 660 or HD 7850 which are much newer and still receive driver updates, unlike this card which had the most recent drivers come out around last year. So yeah, it's not too great in that sense. But for the novelty of the card, I love it, but for practicality you'd be better off with a single card solution. 
but from a time when AMD had nothing to lose and so much going on top, this card was truly a sign of it. Thank you very much for watching, good night. So I will definitely have another video up this week, but I will be heading off on holiday quite soon, meaning that there may be a small gap with the content. You can always catch us over on the Discord where we're always very active, and support us over on Patreon if you want to. Thank you very much for watching, good night.